Hello and welcome back to Bicycle Legs and another edition of Studio Albums Ranked. And for this one, I have a guest with me, the wonderful Martin Popov. So glad to have you back on the channel, my friend. Um, yes. How is, how is it there? This It's early morning for you, isn't it? Yeah, seven thirty in the morning here in Toronto. It's uh, it's warmed up. We had a we had a very cold last few days, but now it's uh, basically seven degrees Celsius, so it's quite nice. Oh, seven degrees! That sounds absolutely heavenly. It's ten thirty at night here, and it's probably still about 23, 24 degrees Celsius. Oh yeah, so. <laughs> nice, nice. So today we're going to be ranking the studio albums of the post punk band from England magazine um wonderful band they had five albums in total they did four albums in the late 70s early 80s broke up in 1981 or 1982 and then um came back and did a, a reunion album like 30 years later so um martin did you want to sort of fill us in anything about um magazine yeah, I, I just love this band, loved them from the beginning, bought everything as new releases right from the beginning. Um, you know, calling them post-punk, it's it's pretty interesting that they're really right in there, kind of like middle, middle 1978, late 1978. So they're really early in the post-punk thing. And uh, what they do is... Um, is is slightly more conventional than than what we know of as post punk from say 83 84 sort of thing where it gets a little little more elastic a little more gnarly on the bass lines a little more um i, I don't want to say artistic because this is very very artistic stuff oh, but yeah. um it's not particularly punky um and i think the post punk uh aspect that they they forge essentially i mean it's it's these guys it's xtc um boy who else would you throw in there i didn't really think of it but i think i think the main thing that they're bringing uh as an aesthetic into the post-punk thing is the bowie berlin era yeah. uh, type stuff that you get on the early albums so uh but yeah this was very hard to do i'll i'll, I'll leave it i'll leave it there until you uh, tr trigger us to get going on the ranking yeah absolutely no i, I definitely as i was re-listening to these sort of yesterday and today um, I was definitely struck by the sort of there you go you know, yesterday and today. Well, <laughs> um, I was. I, I, I wore this because they didn't have a magazine shirt, so I figured I'll I'll I'll, I'll wear the shirt that's as farthest away from magazine as you could possibly <laughs> imagine. So, well, I I don't have a magazine shirt either, so I'm wearing a new shirt I got, which is like 1975 era split ends. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> but. That's um, cool. Yeah, I, I definitely got struck with the sort of the Berlin era sort of Bowie um, feel to some of the stuff as well. Of course, for those of you who don't know, um, Howard Devoto, who was sort of the, the brains behind the band at the beginning, um, he was in the original incarnation of the Buzzcocks and uh, he left them very early on before they really recorded anything much except for that uh, Spiral Scratch EP. Um, he kind of got turned off by the punk movement very early on. And I think that's what you get with magazine is a bit of a reaction to that punk movement. Would you say that that would be a fair um, summation of things? Yeah, it's it's almost like, uh, you know, I, I, I cringe or hate to think about how young these guys were because I've always considered them ab absolutely wise men. You know, I, I basically yeah. have always said magazine are like the Roger Waters solo career of punk um, <laughs> or, or, or of post-punk, but they're essentially inventing post-punk. But yeah, I, I like that, uh, that assessment that um, it just feels like artistically Howard and these guys were just like three and a half steps ahead of anything that you would call punk. Um, yeah. And it's funny that, that, that essentially their first album comes out just a few months after the first Buzzcocks album. And that mm. first Buzzcocks album is an absolute masterpiece too. And it's, oh, yeah. it's, um, it is punk. Um, but it's, it's already late to the game because it's like, like early 1978 and, and, you know, the seminal punk albums had already all come out in 77 sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but, um, it's a it's a really artistic, cool, thoughtful punk as well. But this is way beyond uh, anything to do with punk. Yeah. So there are five albums in total. 
as I said, there's sort of like four from their early period and then one that they did 30 years later as a reunion. So I'm going to have Martin start us off with his number five uh, pick. And okay. Martin, what was, what's your number five pick? All right. So one, one of the funny things is when I pulled my CDs out, I've, I've always had this CD um, sitting next to my magazine ones. Um, Jump Little Children magazine. Um, and then I finally looked up on the internet that the name of the band is Jump Little Children and it's not magazine. So that's funny. So that's going to get uh, get refiled. But um, <laughs> obviously where those where those CDs were, um, I it pains me to say this because it's such a great album, but I am going with the with the latest one, the last one. Um, know thyself with the radon painting on the cover like such a unsettling all their artwork is is kind of just unsettling and moody and cool but yeah, yeah. this is 2011 so we're already talking uh 12 what is it Thir yeah 12 years ago october 24th uh, 2011 um you know it's it's so classy and so interesting and so not attached to any time frame. It's timeless, um, but you know they they basically and and the other cool thing about it is uh, is the band is is really legitimate. I mean it's it's Howard, it's John Doyle on drums, it's Dave Formula, and it's Noco who is uh, is Norman Fisher Johnson, and he's on these great Luxuria albums as yeah. well, right? So this is like the baby magazine, the alternate ba magazine band, right? Um, so there's that connective tissue as well. But um, yeah, the songs, I, the songs I really like on it, I love. I love the production. The production is beautiful. There's mm. all sorts of bass and guitar and interesting keyboard sounds and sound effects and stuff like that. But Do the Meaning, the opening track is amazing. I really like that. Um, I really like the heavy rocking one on here, Holy Dotage. Um, of course, Howard is really cool. That's a very Roger Waters solo career sort of uh, song. There's a lot of spoken word stuff in there. And I really like uh, the burden of a song, which is uh, which sounds like complicated, proggy, you know, early magazine. Uh, but, you know, a bunch of the other ones on here, I'm, I'm not particularly um, that thrilled with. There's a little bit of like... Um, uh, there's a soft ballad with a little bit maudlinness to it. There's a little R and B and funkiness, and there's some chord changes that I'm not crazy about. But that's just this band being. It's a little bit like, like any um any band that you love that that is uh, that makes it really tough for you to love them in a way. Like like the Last Faith No More album or a lot of the No Means No catalog. It's mm. like it's music that it it does make you really work for it, sort of thing. Um. And so and so he will do things that probably he thinks fans aren't going to be that much of a fan of. But he's he's challenging us because uh, this is one of the most you know, this is such an artistic band. They're just absolutely, yeah. you know, rock gods to me sort of thing. So, yeah, it does. It does pain me to put no my, myself there, but I, I play it a lot. It's, it's pretty rude, too. There's some there's some pretty yeah. uh, pornographic stuff on here. Right. Yeah. Uh, it must be said, um, I guess. Which one is that? That's in other theme other thematic material um yes. but yeah even that album cover is just so so freaky right it's great isn't it yeah yeah so there you go that's my number five well as it so happens it's also my number five yeah um, i was lucky nice. enough to pick this up on vinyl recently yeah uh and not pay a absolute fortune for it so i was really happy with that i mean it, it's for me, it's impossible to expect a band doing their first album for 30 years to sound exactly the same as they did back in 1979 or 1980. It's, that's, that's an unreasonable expectation, I think. You know, people grow older, they, you know, their music style changes. That's just natural. I feel that this album has more, like certain parts of it anyway, have sort of almost an alternative rock feel to them as opposed to a post-punk feel. Um, and again, quite understandable after a 30-year period. Although with this one, the probably the reason I do rank it as my number five is because I do miss that sort of post-punk energy that those earlier albums have. Um, but the songs on it, I think a lot of the songs are still really, really strong. And speaking of what you were saying about the lyrics, I, I did say that um, Howard DeVoto's lyrics have definitely not mellowed over the years at all. Um, 
and yes, it's it's the other thematic material. That song is, as you say, you know, verging on pornography. But um, but also, I mean, he's not scared to take on um, topics that might be controversial. I, I'm thinking of a song like um, uh, "Hello, Mr. Curtis." Yeah, you know. Um, I, I said too, there's some really great analog synths and, and Mellotron. You don't hear Mellotron on the other magazine albums, but there is a bit of it on here. And I'm a sucker for a Mellotron. So, um, and yeah, I, I said as well, Holy Dotage was the song for me that had that sort of old magazine feel the most of all the tracks on here. And um, I said that, um, of course, Howard, um, almost sounds like a lost Pink Floyd song in some ways. You know, it's got that real sort of psychedelic feel to it. So, yeah, Know Thyself is my number five, but it's still a really good album and definitely worth um, listening to and, and seeking out if you haven't listened to it. Yeah, cool. All right. So, so your number, number four? Yeah, my number four is uh, I'm going to go with uh, Magic Murder and the Weather. There's my CD of it. There's my vinyl of it. This is my vinyl I bought as a new release back in, uh, what is it, 1981, right? Yeah. Um, still got it. Canadian copy. Um, you know, this is the one where they get a new guitarist in John Mandelson. Um, it's got, it's got uh, again, a thing, you know, post-punk people, uh, synth-pop people, somewhat punk people. Um, there's, uh, you know, there they want to be artistic in so many directions and one direction that this band uh, tries to be artistic as well is in um, not giving you an obvious uh, lovable production. And this out, al this album is like bright and airy and kind of tinny. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's post-punk uh, this, the, you know, in the term of anti-punk, the, the same way um, where a lot of anti-punk, again, is hard to love. I mean, I think the most extreme example of that would be Public Image Limited. Um, yeah. But uh, love about the weather. It's one of my favorite magazine songs of all time. Uh, Vigilance, uh, The Great Man's Secrets, uh, The Great Man's Secrets, uh, kind of jungly and spooky sort of song. Um, I think um, one thing I love about this album, and this, you know, it, it must be put on the record that... Um, this is the album that most fans, I think, would complain about the most that that gets the most abuse, I think. Yeah. Um, people really don't like the fact that uh, that, you know, um, John McGeoch, I actually looked that up how to say that Mc, <laughs> McGeoch. Yeah. Um, uh, is uh, I don't know if that's how he says it, but I looked up a YouTube thing on how to say it. I've, I've never mm. know how to say it, but um, so, so what happens here is you get these, these bright, airy, atmospheric keyboards sort of taking over, but lots and lots of bass too. And that's the other thing. Um, I, I, I'm really embarrassed uh, to say this, uh, and I, I kind of tried to look it up a little bit, but Barry Adamson, correct me if I'm wrong, just so I know here, because it's always been a mystery to me, but is this fretless bass constantly that this guy plays? Because I looked up his basses. And they're just normal basses that he plays. Yeah, right? I um, it sounds fretless, but I think it might be to do with the like effect that he's using. That well, he and, uses and he must then bass. do a lot of bends then too, right? Yeah, I think so. And uh, but yeah. also there's like um, I don't know what the actual effect is called, but there's this um, sort of bass effect. Um, Chris Squire used it a bit on the Tomato album. It okay. sort of gives it in, instead oh. of just having a boom, boom, boom sort of sound, it gives yeah. it a boom, boom sort okay. of sound, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And that, that I think gives the impression of fretless bass, even if it's not necessarily. Yeah. Because, you know, we've been, I've been uh, working on a, a King Crimson project, of course. And, uh, and there's always been this discussion that nobody's even really sure where Tony Levin is playing fretless or not sort of thing as well. But, so it must be said about Barry Adamson that it sounds like fretless almost all the time. And it's mm. gorgeous. It's an, it's amazing sound and it's not a gnarly post-punk sound. It's a, it's a very smooth fretless bass sound, a, a Jeff, Jeff Berlin sort of sound. Um, 
and uh, and I think you get that uh, he's really prominent on here because you know as the narrative is supposed to go on this album, uh, you know we're missing the the strong presence of of that uh, of that legendary magazine guitarist, and we've got this John Mandelson instead. Uh, but yeah, like I say, I think you hear you hear these very um, these very bright and brittle drums. You hear these very bright and atmospheric keyboards, and you hear this uh, mellifluous, uh, beautiful, fretless-sounding bass throughout this whole whole album. So I think those things, and of course Howard is such a presence with his vocals and his lyrics and his phrasing, um, and and his vocal melodies that uh, it it gives a, a great cohesion to this album, even though it's the album uh, fans do like to complain about. But yeah, I, I love everything about it. You know, this poison with that Farfisa sort of sound and the garden is like kind of like dub clash on here. Suburban Rhonda, mellow keyboardy kind of funny one there. Um, I don't know if that's a that's a reference to Frank Zappa or, or what, um, or because he had a Suburban Rhonda. I don't know what a Suburban Rhonda is, but, uh, but, uh, but I think Zappa Zappa says that somewhere. I don't know if it's before this album or after this album, but uh, I think he does say it somewhere. But there you go. That's my number four. Well, it looks like we're going to be in agreement for a lot of this because it's also my number four. Okay. Um, and yeah, I I kind of understand why hardcore magazine fans don't like this album so much because it is much more keyboard heavy. And um, it's actually Ben Mandelson, not John Mandelson. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry about that. I've got yeah. John down here. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just looking at the back cover. So, okay. um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, he definitely doesn't make his presence felt the way that um, John McGeer does on the first three albums, or even that NOCO does on the, on the um, Know Thyself album. Um, so it is a lot more keyboard heavy. Um, there is definitely elements of synth pop creeping in. I mean, this was a time when um, Dave Formula was also very heavily involved with Visage, you know, the band that had yep. Fade to Grey as a big hit single. And, yep. um, and John McGeer and Barry Adamson were a little bit involved with Visage as well, but Dave Formula was sort of heavily, heavily involved with them. And I think a little bit of that creeps into this album. That's not a problem for me, but I can understand why it is a problem for the more sort of punky and post-punky fans of the band. Um, I definitely don't think it deserves the hate it gets. I think it's a really good album. I agree with you about the production being maybe not lovable, but it's definitely, uh, it gives the album a distinct sound all the way through. And I always love productions where, you know, the production's sort of consistent throughout the album. Um, it doesn't actually list a producer on this album either. It says it's mixed by Martin Hammett, but it doesn't actually say who it's produced by. That's true. So that, that, that's an interesting little tidbit with that as well. Yeah. Um, it's got a recorded and engineered credit, which is usually the uh, the stand-in for produced, and that goes to John Brand, and I don't know who he is at, at Trident. Yeah, I don't yeah. know either. Um, I, I definitely, the first song on the album about the weather, it has almost a soul feel to it, you know, uh, which is unusual, you know, for their music up to that point. I think a little bit of that creeps in on Know Thyself as well. Um, but I think the magazine sound, sound is still recognisable on most of these songs, even if they are a lot more keyboard heavy than uh, the first three albums. Um, I think Come Alive um, has almost a Gary Newman sound to it. Um, until you get to the end where there's like a Hammond organ solo, which just comes out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, my other favourite song on this album is Naked Eye. I think that song is just wonderfully demented, um, just the music to it. And then when, like, Howard's vocals don't come in until about halfway through the song. And then when they come in, they just continue that sort of weird, demented feeling that that song has. That's probably my favourite song on the album. But, yeah, that's my number four as well. Um, yeah, you Magic know, Murder of the Weather. 
To prepare for this, I went and played, uh, I, I got curious and played that visage, uh, the anvil again. And, uh, you know, th the thing about this album is it's, I'm pretty sure it's real drums all the way throughout. It's just, and it's very loose, very, very just lively drumming, right? Um, so there, there's a big difference because that, that visage album is, is quite synth poppy. Right? Oh, yes. Uh, early synth poppy. It's like every song has got, just got this percolating beat going on it. It was, it was actually quite annoying to play. I, but. I think there might be some drum machines on the garden, but I, I could okay. be wrong with that. But All right, yeah. other than that, yes, I think most of the drums are live. So, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, there, there's so many things about this that, that leave it, I think, away from that. I mean, it's essentially a conventionally put together album with all that slinky bass all over the place and everything. Too. Yeah. So, okay. So my number three, oh, I had, I had one other, uh, I had one other luxury, luxury, a prop to show, I guess. One oh, of those very ones. nice. Yeah, that's right. This, this one here. Uh, th this is so cool. I mean, I, I, I don't know how I ended up with this, but I'm, I, I love that this is actually a 12 inch single and it's uh, it's blind stamped like that blind. Oh yeah. Stamped. Nice. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, okay. So my number three, I went with, uh, may as well show my, show my other, uh, well, my other props here quickly, get them out of the way. So we've got scree, which is a uh, rarities collection, right? And then we've got Play, which was the live album. That's oh, that's a great live album recorded in Melbourne. Oh, yeah. Cool. Nice. Nice. Okay. And look at that. Oh, yeah. This is a uh, Robin Simon on guitar. Yeah, there was, yeah. That, there was a period where uh, they were between guitarists kind of thing, right? Yeah, he was, so, a, okay. he was a guitarist in the uh, John Fox era of Ultravox. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, so my number three is uh, is real life. So I'm going with the debut. And again, you know, you look at the uh, the artsiness and artisticness of this band. Mm. Um, it it goes from the album covers all the way down, from the name of the band, magazine. What a strange name, right? Um, a lot of sort of literary references and stuff. But this one, this one, I think is the most uh, the most frantic and the rawest of all of them, which you would kind of expect. Yeah, but I love definite gaze, kind of freak beady keyboardy one. My tulpa, melodic, groovy, shot by both sides is a huge classic of theirs, and it's pretty pretty hard rock and punky song, right? Yeah. Uh, re recoil is super fast, heavy punky one there with a military you know sort of snare on it sort of thing. Motorcade like heavy joy division sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I've always sort of um, had as a pair, uh, you know, conceptually speaking, um, real life with secondhand daylight. Um, and I, I don't really feel there are other pairs. I don't even feel like uh, the correct use of soap really pairs up with med. So this is a band that doesn't really have pairs, but I mean, I, I think I, I put these two records uh, uh, somewhat, but uh, yeah, the great beautician in the sky, the light pours out of me with the, with the kind of one and three beat sort of thing on that. That's another big classic of theirs, right? Um, big baseline on that. And then parade with a very dark Bowie sort of Berlin sort of sound on that where you're getting that come in. But yeah, June 19, 78 and the buzzcocks album is march 1978 so they're just separated by by like three three months and yeah. yet these guys have moved on and buzzcocks are just saying here we are here's our first punk album yeah. uh, in uh, in june of 78 i mean like i say it's an absolute classic and it does interesting things uh that go beyond um i don't know what you would the most to me the most rote punk album of all time is the dead boys first album oh, i mean yeah. that's that's literally like, you know, if you wanted to just draw up, you know, have it by committee, what a punk album is supposed to be like, it's that one. I mean, um, even but, the uh, title, Young, Loud and Snotty, it's just exactly. like a pro forma punk title, yeah, isn't yeah. it? It it's like it's like the Patty the the Patty Smith parody on Saturday Night Live of Patty Smith, right? Come <laughs> up with a title like that, right? Um, so yeah, so I'll I'll go with uh, I'll go with real life as my number three. Very nice. Um, I am actually going to deviate slightly from you this time. Okay. Um, my number three is actually Secondhand Daylight. All right. Uh, this was these top three though were super super hard for me to to rank, and I could probably change my ranking on all three of them depending on what day you ask me. But for today, I'm going with Secondhand Daylight as my number three. And it starts with the really sort of stately um, Feed the Enemy, which I really, really like. Um, 
Rhythm of Cruelty, I think, still has some of those punk roots in it. Um, I absolutely love Cut Out Shapes. That song's just, ah, oh, really, really love that song. Um, I feel like the balance between the guitars and the keyboards on this album is just absolutely perfect. Um, it's um, the only thing I think that made me choose this one as number three is that the, the other two albums that I'm going to pick, I probably just like a couple more of the songs on them a little better. Although Permafrost is a classic. I mean, you know, and the funny thing is with these first three albums, the thing I noticed for my personal taste is the best song on each album is the last song on each album, mm. yeah. which that's a really strange thing. You usually expect bands to sort of top load their albums with the best songs, but I feel like the best song on each of these first three albums is actually the album closer. So that's a, that's a weird sort of little thing to note there. But yeah, that's my number three, Secondhand Daylight, 1979. Yeah, I, I love your comment about how your, th your top two are just because there's a few songs you like a little more. That's the cool thing about these difficult bands that you love so much that, that, you, that, that they, they are really making you work for it. So what happens with those kinds of bands is that, is that, yeah, sometimes there's two or three or maybe four songs that are not to your personal taste. It's not that they're bad because you basically think the band's a genius in this case. Yeah. I mean, I just think everything they do is, is on purpose. They don't do bad things. Um, they, they just do things that are not to your particular taste, I guess, is the way I would describe some of these sorts of bands, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so my next one, uh, my number two, um, so the funny thing that happens is, uh, so there's a CD called The Correct Use of Soap, yeah. um, but my new release in Canada from the day it ever came out was uh, an alternative use of soap. Yeah, I, um, I was reading about that, how you had a, a different version. There. Yeah, and it's, uh, this is how it came. It was a uh, die cut with the hole in the middle, like that Tubes album, probably yeah. through other albums in history, right? Um, no liner notes uh, to speak of. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's why. So yeah, we've got the band listed on the back uh, and then the songs on the record, um, but that's it. That's how it came. That's my original Canadian copy. Um, so the thing about alternative use of soap, which kind of works out in the Canadian album's favor, is um, Model Worker and I'm a Party on Correct Use of Soap are probably two of my least favorite songs. Um, but um, and so they're they're swapped out for two other ones. I think it's swapped out, I, I believe. Hang on. Uh, yeah, I, I, I got. Yeah, I, I got um, in Canada. We got Upside Down, which is a really cool up tempo one. Um, and the light pours out of me, a new thumpier version of the light pours out of me from, from real, um, yeah, from the first one. So, so yeah, it was a two, two song swap, but, um, so I love this album because, um, it's, uh, what they're doing on this record, I think is, uh, is stripping down and trying to be more immediate. It's their, it's their, it's their moving slightly towards, um, they're still doing, um, you know, the, the challenging rhythms. It can be a little dance here. I mean, because you're frightened is definitely just a very dancey song with a heavy metal chorus kind of thing. Um, kind of, di kind of different for them, but love it's very, very immediate. Um, you know, the, the likes of uh, You Never Knew Me is so cool, kind of like a airy sort of ballad. It's got those those ethereal female uh, backing vocals on it. Philadelphia, up-tempo, kind of soul, soulful. I Want to Burn Again, um, cool, dark, acoustic-y sort of ballad. Um, uh, thank you. I think the Sly Stone cover fits perfectly on here. It's it never, never bothered me that a, that they're covering people because I think they're geniuses. I don't want them to cover people. Right. I just, mm. his lyrics are some of the greatest lyrics of all time and he's amazing. He's like a legend. Right. Um, but so, but it never bothered me that there was a cover on here. Sweetheart contract. I really, really like it's with the, with the kind of crazy carousel sort of thing going on song for under the floorboards, just good melodic immediate sort of thing. So, so maybe this is their ZZ top eliminator, I guess, mm. uh, uh, you know, of, of magazine albums. If, if you can get that way but uh yeah um 
had it as, as a new release. I played it all my life very regularly, um, as as with everything with this band. Um, but yeah, that's that's my Canadian copy, and that's my number uh, two. Okay, thank you. Um, my number two, I thought was going to be my number one until I went and re-listened to all these albums again over the last couple of days. Right. And then I realized there was one I liked just the teeniest bit better. Um, but my number two is going to be the debut, Real Life. Now, I didn't come into this band right from the get-go. I was a little bit young. Um, I was aware of magazine, um, but I didn't get into them until I picked up this copy of this album in a cheap bin at my local record store and I thought I need to give this a go I took it home and it was just absolute love at first listen just this is music that is right in my wheelhouse as far as you know I grew up listening to sort of post-punk new wave music from sort of late 70s early 80s um, and so this absolutely sort of hit me the first time I listened to it. To me, Definitive Gaze is, an, is a statement of purpose. Like, it's just like the band saying, this is who we are, this is what we're gonna do. Um, you know, strap in, this is gonna be a great ride. The rest of side one, I feel like is probably the punkiest stuff they ever did. Things like my tulpa and shot by both sides and recoil. Um, I feel like apart from Definitive Gaze, I feel like Side 1 is sort of like where Magazine were coming from and Side 2 was where they were going, if that makes any sense. Mm. Um, the only song I'm not a big fan of on this album is Burst. I feel like it drags a little bit. Um, and that's not to say that I don't like the slower Magazine songs because... Um, Parade on side two is a slower magazine song and it's my favorite song on the album. So, but definitely sort of Motorcade, um, the great beautician in the sky, the light pours out of me. There I feel more the indicators of what you would get on Secondhand Daylight and the correct use of soap. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I've got um, much more to say. Side two, complex and artier than side one, which is sort of a little more straightforward and punkier, except for definitive gaze, which I think probably musically fits more in with what's on side two. But that's, yeah, my number two. And I thought this was going to be my number one, but in the end, it's my number two. So real life. Yeah, cool. All right. So my number one is, uh, is Secondhand Daylight. Um... You know, I, I love that last Roger Waters album and I love Amused to Death and I love Pink Floyd Animals. And this is a mix of all that with gnarly guitar and Ber and Berlin era David Bowie and uh, and great post-punk bass, saxophone. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm generally not a, not a horns guy uh, in rock, but I but I love well-placed, a well-placed saxophone, David Bowie, Amandul 2, Vandergraaff. In anything like that right there's this great uh spock's beard snow um there's some amazing sax i think on there yeah um, but uh but yeah that what what crazy you know artwork it's it's just got that minimalist it's not it's not really trying to please you in any way and then the very i love how you use the word stately right for uh for feed the enemy but you know that back cover is stately mm. even right and uh, and there's my CD of it. Um, so yeah, what I like about this one is uh, is it, it just seems like a beautifully produced panoramic, and you absolutely get that with uh, with Feed the Enemy. Um, new drummer in in John Doyle here. Beautiful, strange drum sound on this album. Rhythm of Cruelty is kind of cool. Cutout shapes again. I totally agree with you. That one is so sinister. And again, you know we you know this this band they create a world that is um that's really cynical and dark and and artsy and a little bit heroiny sounding right a little mm. bit a little bit david bowie uh not eating any food sounding right <laughs> uh you know just getting skinnier and skinnier and howard devoto kind of strikes you as that sort of guy but again i i i, I literally 
I literally consider this band and No Means No as the only two bands that sort of strike me in this particular way that are even close to each other kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I wanted your heart. Is that that's not a great with the thin air? Uh, very Bowie, uh, uh, Bowie with the sax there. That's so. So the thin air is like an instrumental that kicks off side two. That sounds like the beginning of Feed the Enemy in a way, right? And Permafrost is amazing there as well. And uh, and there we go for the pornographic again. That that we go yeah. all the way back to the new album uh, for that sort of thing. But uh, and yeah, look at that. Uh, look at that gatefold, eh? With mm. the. Uh, you know, the band all stretched out and uh, and just again, you know, even even you look at the way they're dressed, it's just it's just timeless that uh, this this isn't linked really to any time. It's it, yeah. it's uh, it's it's too organic and, and traditionally and progly put together to be considered, you know, the really uh, artsy out there post punk of the later post punk. Um, but yeah, it's just linked to no era. The guys just seem to be linked to no era. They just seem to be geniuses on their instruments and what they do and Howard mm. with his literary uh, ness and all that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, ab absolute, uh, absolute classic there. But uh, you know, even that, even that color, uh, just has always made me think of Pink Floyd animals. To me, this is the the Pink Floyd animals of of punk. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. No, that that front cover, it you know, it's almost got like a German existentialism kind of feel to it. And yeah, yeah you know what you say about the the gatefold. I think one of the things that how Devoto got very quickly disillusioned with with punk was that it was as much a sort of a, a fashion movement as it was a music movement and I think that really wasn't where he was coming from at all yeah so you know that might be you know why he left Buzzcocks and ended up doing this instead which is you know yeah. quite different but yeah who's that no, uh, who's that um that great data collages is it Hannah Hotch is her, is that her name um, but that, um, that reminds me of that too. Yeah, like those yeah. Great data collect. My favorite, my favorite data things ever are are the collages of her. Yeah, and I think that's her name. I think it's Hannah Hosh or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's so so it's yeah, it's a bit data too, right? Yeah. yeah. So my number one is going to be the correct use of soap from 1980, and I think the the thing that made me pick this album over the other two. Um, isn't so much that I think the songs are that much better. I th it's the energy of this album that really, I think, made me gravitate towards this one as my number one. Mm -hmm. It's just got a, a real, you know, the fast ones have got like this absolutely sort of wonderful kinetic energy to them. And then the slower ones have this sort of palpable nervous energy to them um, that I really, really like. Um, I agree with you that normally I wouldn't really want to hear this band do cover versions, but I think the version they do of Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself Again actually works very well in the context of the album. Um, and, um, and a song from Under the Floorboards. I mean, just absolute closer, and it might be my favourite magazine song of all time. Um, I don't know if you know this, but um, do you know Jason Faulkner, who was in the original lineup of Jellyfish? No. Oh, okay. He's really great sort of power pop musician. Um, he yeah, I know did the Jellyfish of, album, yeah. The, yeah, the well, he, that, right? he was the guitar player and bass player on that first Jellyfish album. And um, he went on to have a solo career and stuff. And he did a lot of cover versions as B-sides for singles and that sort of thing. And he does this absolutely gorgeous sort of down-tempo acoustic version of a song from under the floorboards hmm. definitely worth checking out if you haven't wow. heard it cool. but um yeah that's my number one and it's as i say it's not necessarily the quality of the songs i think the quality of the songs on the first three albums are all very much of a muchness for me it's just the sheer energy in these songs that um just pushes it over the top for me so that's my number one nice very cool Excellent. Right. So um, thank you very much again, Martin, for uh, doing the show with me. Um, it's great to have somebody else who knows this band. I know that a lot of my regular viewers, this is probably a little bit outside their wheelhouse. So 
Um, for those of you who are watching this, haven't really listened to this band, go and check these albums out. There isn't a stinker in the lot. They're all really, really good. There's only five in the catalogue, so it doesn't take a long time to get through it. Definitely worth checking out. And the live album play, really, really good too. Um, please like, share and subscribe. It really does help the channel out. If you're new to the channel, please go and have a look at some of my other videos. Everything's playlisted. So if you want to look at some of my other studio albums rank shows, there's a playlist for those. Or if you want to look at my Bicycle Legs Discovers Rush series, there's a playlist for that. Or my um, favorite albums of all time playlist for that and so on and so on. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm at Bicycle Legs on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, on Instagram, I tend to post the new records I've bought or the ones I happen to be listening to at the time, as well as posting channel updates. On Twitter, I talk about anything and everything, and uh, but I am definitely giving that more of a music focus. Martin, for anybody who may not know, and I'm sure there's lots of people watching know you very well, but can you just let know people know where they can find you? Yeah, we have a YouTube channel called The Contrarians, of course, um, which you've been part of. Um, yes. And, uh, and uh, I have an audio podcast that I've been doing for over three years now. I'm up to 189 episodes called History and Five Songs with Martin Popoff, anywhere you get your podcast. And I've written a bunch of rock books, and, uh, and that's all available at uh, martinpopoff.com, the latest pretty swanky ones and slip covers and stuff there's a david bowie one bowie at uh 75 and uh and a pink floyd dark side of the moon um you know 50th anniversary big big hardcover yeah. full color throughout in in um and and uh and the, the other latest are the ones on the damned uh where i review every single I, you know, damn song, analyze every damn song. My Alice Cooper book got busted into two and I've got um, uh, two deal books that are fairly recent as well. So that's all martinpopoff.com. And links for all of that will be in the description of this video for all of you to check out. And I just want to say, I love the David Bowie book and I'm very much looking forward to the Pink Floyd one when that comes out. So <laughs> nice. thank you very much for watching everyone. Thank you, Martin, for being on the show and I'll see you in the next one.